Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Talk TV. So pop the kettle on, this is the Royal Tea. I'm Sarah Hewson. Coming up, has King Charles promoted his secret weapon? Who's been making fun of Meghan Markle again? And which royals have been kissing Donald Trump's behind? Well, according to him anyway. Joining me to discuss all of that, our Royal commentator and Talk TV regular, Afia Hagen, Royal editor at The Sun, Matt Wilkinson, and Royal commentator and Talk TV host, Daisy McAndrew. Hello to all of you. And don't forget, you can like and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Now this week, King Charles gave his first Commonwealth Day address as monarch against the backdrop of protests at Westminster Abbey. The King urged the family of nations to strive together for the global common good at the annual service celebrating the Commonwealth. Since the death of the Queen, a number of Commonwealth nations, including Antigua and Barbuda, Belize and the Bahamas, have signalled they could kickstart plans to hold referendums. I wonder, Afia, what you made of the address, King Charles's first Commonwealth Day as monarch, an important moment for him mm -hmm. to choose those words carefully. Yeah. What message do you think he was trying to get across? I think he was saying basically we're stronger together please don't leave. You know, I think it was very much aimed at particularly those countries that you mentioned, the Bahamas, Belize, you know, talking about the common good. You know, he also mentioned climate change as well, which I think, we, you know, we more than expected him to do. But I do think it was a call to action. I do think it was a sort of sense of we're better together, consider the Commonwealth before you make your decisions and um, that kind of thing. But I do think in those particular countries, the Bahamas, um, Belize, I think those three countries or those particular countries, their minds are made up. So perhaps this is maybe aimed more at Australia, Canada, New Zealand, who might be teetering on the edge, who might be just considering their place within the Commonwealth or the place within the realms at the moment. I was going to ask you about Canada because I know you do a lot of work uh, for the Canadians. Mm. Recent polling there suggesting a pretty indifferent attitude Absolutely. to the monarchy. Absolutely, and that has changed so much since the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Um, and especially in, in Quebec, actually, there's a real um, want to not have uh, Canada be part of the realms, to remove you know, the royal family from from the head of state, remove the monarch, excuse me, from the head of state. Um, and so I think that feeling is being echoed across Canada, but also, like I said, in Australia and New Zealand. Now, Canada is far from going down that road, but conversations are certainly happening. And Matt, what, what tone do you think the king was seeking to set in this first Commonwealth Day service? Well, I thought his speech was actually wonderful. I've got to say, I was in there, I'm not bragging, but we, we had a copy of the speech initially. We read it and we thought, this is a very child speech. He's using the same language he uses a lot. But when he delivered it, I really liked it. And it felt to me like it was almost his manifesto mm -hmm. for how he wanted to run the Commonwealth. He's the head of the Commonwealth. But I just want to pick up on something. I hate doing this, but the, there is a difference between the realms and the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And the, yes, there are countries that may want to get rid of the, uh, the king as the head of state, like um, uh, Barbados did recently. But the Commonwealth is uh, 56 nations that... A family of a nations, A family of nations that have joined... It's, it, the, the king isn't the head of the state of these countries. It's a free association to share ideas, uh, for heads of state to meet, to share environmental projects. Um, it's not that people aren't leaving the Commonwealth. Okay, they're joining the Commonwealth. But he is a figurehead. He's the figurehead of it, but let's just split the realms of the Commonwealth. They're two completely different things. No one's leaving the Commonwealth. It's growing. It's successful. It's like a European Union in many ways without the political, um, political union. It, it's doing well and they share so many ideas. And we had uh, Togo and Gabon joined mm. last summer. It, it's growing. It's, it's a successful organisation and he really enjoys being the, the figurehead for what it. What has been it? Uh, question for many years now is whether actually having a, a British monarch as head of the Commonwealth is the right thing to do. Now the Queen dealt with that yeah. uh, as part of her succession planning and, and Charles is head of the Commonwealth. Absolutely and, and it was very interesting because we know that there were a lot of discussions in the last few years of the Queen's life about the future of the Commonwealth and about how she felt 
huge personal pride, but, but felt that it was much more important than her personal pride that the Commonwealth and the royal family's role within the Commonwealth were to succeed. But of course, Charles and his advisers knew that there was going to be some tension mm -hmm. after the Queen's death because, as Afir was, was, was suggesting, a lot of the populations of these countries had a personal loyalty and fondness, even love, uh, for the Queen less so for Charles and you can see that in the polls and of course it does when you think back to the Queen's coronation a lot of people thought around the Commonwealth and we will talk about this later I'm sure that she was literally put on earth by God now we are in a completely different world now that that sense that somehow the royal family you know have some sort of God-given right to rule over us has completely gone. So Charles knows he's got to earn that love and respect and he's got to try to find a new, more modern role in order to be accepted. Uh, not just in the Commonwealth, though, Matt, can I pick up? A, sure. In this country, there were protests, loud protests taking pl place yeah. outside Westminster Abbey. Um, I mean, not huge crowds, but um, the campaign group Republic saying they're going to turbocharge their protests in the run-up to the coronation. How aware were you of that? Would the royals have been aware of that as they Not were really. approaching? Well, well, is, it, is it even an issue for them? I like the idea that they are protesting. I'd love to have a debate, you know, about why we have a monarchy and why we aren't a it's republic. Like, it'd be great. Um, republic, I spoke to Graham, he's the Graham Smith, he was the chairman of Republic. When I got there, there was three of them and he assured me more would turn up. I went into the Abbey and I think there was 10 or 15. What he is asking for is a televised one-to-one -one debate with the King, <laughs> <laughs> which is not going to happen, but he, that, that's what he wants. And I, I like the idea that he wants to have this debate out in public, but let's be fair, there was uh, probably 15, 20 people with Not My King placards. It's not uh, you know, the population uprising and, and, and asking for us not to have a king. It's just a small people. But, but let's not forget, I mean, people are lazy now and a lot of protest happens on social media. Yeah. Now, of course, social media isn't the real world and that was the real world, but there is a lot more protest on social media. People can't be bothered to go to, you know, yeah. to, to, to get, go out in, in the sort of rain and the drizzle mm. and go and protest. So it, it sort of depends which community of people are going to look if you're looking for protest you can find it but not <laughs> no. not there on the no. day and there is a feeling that we have to remember that of the 2.5 billion people that make up the commonwealth and the realms most of those people are of the global south and also a lot of those countries Ghana especially when I'm from where I'm from where my heritage is from you know our countries that were once colonized by the British now are part of the commonwealth voluntarily, like you said, but some countries feel that there is a slight hangover of imperialism. So how does it benefit them? Those are genuine conversations. So perhaps, like you so rightly said, it's a conversation around who should be the head of the Commonwealth? Should it be associated with the royal family in that right? Well, Charles was, sorry, Charles was elected or selected or appointed by the Commonwealth as the head. He's not, he doesn't have, as we were saying, a god been elected with a God-given right to run no, the No, that isn't a hereditary that's title that's passed automatically so, from yeah. one monarch uh, to the next. Um, let's move on, though, to talk more about titles, because it was announced last Friday that Prince Edward has been given his late father's Duke of Edinburgh title, while his wife Sophie, formerly the Countess of Wessex, has now been elevated to Duchess of Edinburgh. Uh, Matt, um, it's taken a while for this to happen there were some question marks as to whether it was going to happen what's what's been going on behind the scenes what's the inside story um i, I think um he got it for his 59th birthday which is nice so there is talk maybe they waited until a special day to make coincided with a visit to edinburgh as coincided well very cleverly with a, with a visit to edinburgh um so he was due to get he was promised duke of edinburgh title on the day that he married sophie in 1999 they said you would get it one day obviously the philip prince philip died april 2021 and people edward was asking why don't i have it privately why haven't i received this title yet and there were questions that maybe the king wanted this title to maybe go to charlotte because uh, George will be the Prince of Wales, uh, Louis, unfortunately, may be the Duke of York. Um, and so that they want the Edinburgh title to be in, the, in that lineage, in the in the Further in the up succession. the pecking order, effectively. Exactly. So Edward, finally, he, had a little, he complained a little bit, apparently, behind the scenes. They've agreed that he can be Duke of Edinburgh, but it doesn't pass to his son James when yeah. he dies. So it can still go to Charlotte 
where after and still stay in the line of succession rather than go to James, who will be a distant cousin by the time he gets the title. And we have Sophie now as a Duchess of Edinburgh, yeah. a title that for a short period belonged to the Queen. Exactly, because um, the Queen and Philip were given the, the Edinburgh titles when they got married, as the children of monarchs do tend to get, you know, a, a dukedom. Mm. And, and actually going back to, so, so it's, it, it's very poignant, and we know Sophie and the Queen were very, very close, so I think that'll works well and Sophie and Edward have become much more popular than they were which is normally the other way around you normally have these young glamorous royal couples you know you think of Diana you think of Kate you think of Meghan and then sometimes you know their sort of candle might flicker a little bit and their, their, their starlight might dim but actually with Edward and Sophie it's been the other way around they've become increasingly popular and and sort of loved and respected but also don't forget it always makes me laugh that Again, normally you would become a duke when you got married, but Edward decided not to. That's why he was the earl. They were the earl and countess of Wessex because he was meant to be the Duke of Cambridge. But the story goes that he turned that title down because he fancied being the Duke of Wessex, the, the um, Earl of Wessex, which, which was a bit of a made up title in a way and apparently it's because he loved the movie Shakespeare in Love <laughs> and it was in Shakespeare in Love and Colin Firth played Lord Wessex. Now I mean that that, that has never been it's a very romantic ideal yeah. isn't it? I mean, but, it it's know. crazy isn't it and also if you look at the movie he was a ghastly man <laughs> Wessex so I don't know why he wanted to be that but that's that's the myth I don't know whether it's an and now we myth. have uh, James as the Earl of Wessex exactly um, Let's move on to uh, another story of, of importance this week. Voting opened on Monday in the contest to succeed Nicola Sturgeon as leader of the SNP. Debates have been taking place and the front runner Hamza Youssef has declared that Scotland could ditch the monarchy within five years of independence. Mm -hmm. uh, Fia, mm -hmm. how concerned will the King be uh, about this? I think he will be concerned about this. Um, the SNP have the stronghold in Scotland at the moment, at the moment, uh, Hamza Youssef is a very popular character. So if he becomes the next leader of the SNP, the next first minister, he might very well be able to do this. But this is going to be a very long process for Scotland to untangle itself from the United Kingdom, from the monarchy. I, I think he's saying this will go hand in hand with an independence vote. Now, when Which, Nicola, as we know, isn't as straightforward it, exactly. as the SNP might like it to be. And Nicola Sturgeon had always said that the question of the monarchy and Scotland wouldn't actually be in any independence question. Hamza Youssef has said it will be. I think he will be concerned about this. Um, but it's a long process, it's a long time away, and it's not something that's going to happen overnight. I mean, he talks about it not being, the monarchy not being part of his vision for the future of yeah. Scotland, and he's talking about a five year time frame, but I, I, but, I can't but, see but that. It's, it, it's just naked electioneering this Correct. because. If you look at opinion polls in Scotland, the whole, you know, the Scottish population, as in all the people who would vote in a general election in Scotland, they're pretty split on whether they're pro or anti-monarchy. But if you look at the SNP specifically and SNP voters, they are much more anti-monarchy. So Hamza Yusuf is appealing to the electorate that is voting for him to be leader, and then I, you can bet your bottom dollar the whole thing will be quietly It also left got in the headlines side. after that debate, didn't it? Yeah. But it's, you say maybe in five years, I'd say not in a million years <laughs> would this, would that ever happen? And you're right, it, it, he's just, it's rabble-rousing pandering to his, you know, core vote core to get votes. elected and it will gradually slip away and you'll never hear of it again, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, but very similar to a lot of other polls, it is extraordinary when you look at Scottish polls about the monarchy, the age difference, as in young Scots are really not very pro-monarchy at all, in more that's, marked that's, than the rest of the UK. That's the challenge that King Charles has, yes. generally, isn't it, anyway, yeah. to appeal to that younger generation. As the coronation draws nearer every week, we will update you with all of the latest news and announcements coming from the palace. This is Coronation Check-In. The King is reportedly having spiritual guidance sessions with the Archbishop of Canterbury to prepare for the coronation. It's understood Justin Welby is giving the monarch religious guidance on several key elements of the service at Westminster Abbey, including the significance of his coronation oath, the commitments he will make to his subjects and the Christian symbolism of the regalia. And given the significance, uh, Daisy, of what is about to unfold, this makes sense. 
yes. doesn't it? I mean, monarchs and archbishops of Canterbury have always gone hand in hand. Their relationship is much closer, I think, than a lot of people know. Now, of course, before Charles, and Charles himself, we know, is a very religious man. He's probably, well, he's certainly less religious than his mother was, and I think she was probably less religious than her father was. But that's just sort of the way that society has gone. But in Harry's book, he said, he described his father as a deeply religious man. He said that Charles prays every evening, every night, you know, every bedtime. So we know he has a deep faith, but of course he has a huge responsibility. So there is the significance of all the different bits of the coronation and, and the dove representing uh, you know, uh, faith and, and all these different elements. But then there is the outward looking significance where we know Charles has wanted to unite different faiths. He has decided not to use the expression, you know, faiths plural, but stick with the faith. However, we know that he wants to include other faiths. So there are lots of different religious elements that need careful thought at the coronation. And Matt, we've also heard about those preparations for the coronation, a, a stage, mm. uh, almost a replica Westminster Abbey being built inside Buckingham Palace. Yeah, I love this. So yeah. was it last Friday, I think, workmen quietly snuck into Buckingham, if you can quietly sneak into Buckingham <laughs> Palace, but I they got the seen, <laughs> they got seen with the, uh, with the scaffolding and they've, uh, the ballroom is a vast place inside Buckingham Palace. Um, it's the largest room in the palace and they've created what, they haven't, can't obviously create the whole Westminster Road, but they've created the areas where the coronation ceremony will take place. And my understanding is that they will literally be putting arrows on the floor mm. and numbers on the floor to tell people where they need to go to rehearse for the big day. So we will get Charles and Camilla and William and Catherine and everybody else at some stage, I think they're finishing this week, finishing the renovations, going in there, going through their steps uh, bit by bit so it all goes well on, on the day. It's like the wedding rehearsal. I was just yeah. thinking as you talk through that, but on a, a large, 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 larger yeah. scale. Uh, and we know from Lady Glen Connor's diaries, who was um, at the coronation with the Queen, um, that the Queen did exactly the same. She had rehearsals, but that was post-war. And the Queen, I think, had a, a, a bit of curtain as her sort of fake she, she, snuck the the she, snuck, she snuck into the abbey. She snuck. She snuck into the abbey, but they couldn't close the abbey for, su for such a long period of time for the rehearsal. So yeah. the, the queen, I think, believe, actually snuck into the abbey and, and walked around and, herself and at some stage did to practice. And had to, yeah, practice with all the gear. Well, I did wonder with the Commonwealth Day service taking place at the abbey mm. this week whether they were sort of sitting there thinking, yeah. "Gosh, we're going to be back here for the big day yeah. coming up very soon," and we'll be bringing you all the updates on that every week from now on. Queen Elizabeth II and Diana, Princess of Wales, among other correspondents, will be shown to have kissed Donald Trump's behind, according to the former US president, although he wasn't quite as polite as that. Uh, Trump, who has a book of correspondence out soon, made the claim while promoting its release. I mean, I knew that he was a big fan of the Queen. He was. A fear, mm -hmm. but he's telling us that she was clearly a big fan of his, according to him. I mean, Donald Trump is just, I mean, he's special, isn't he? He's a special guy. Um, he's known to embellish the truth. Now, he does have a book of correspondence coming out, so we are going to see these letters, but I'm sure what it probably says is, Dear Donald, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, yours sincerely, Queen Elizabeth II. And he has translated that to mean, you are the greatest man that's ever alive, I'm kissing your ass. That's not what's happening. I'm 100% sure, my, my words, we'll get the book, we'll read it, that it literally is, they were being polite and he has taken that as, they are kissing my ass. It must be wonderful to receive letters, as a, someone like Donald yeah, Trump, to receive letters from the Queen inviting you to a state visit and yes, things like that. Of course. But yeah, I don't think it will translate Just that polite language, yeah. and he's taken that as they love And me. I hope he's respectful about it, to be quite frank, because these are letters, you know, that our Queen has sent to the US President. Well, they're pieces so of the history, isn't they? Well, and of course, do you remember when um, Donald Trump said uh, how much he loved, he did say how much the Queen enjoyed his company and how much he enjoyed her, uh, because he remi she reminded him of his mother. His mother, and his mother was very much a fan of the Queen. Was a royalist. She, which is a royalist, and that's why he was so desperate to have tea with the Queen. Before we go, Harry and Meghan have been mocked on Saturday Night Live at another <laughs> late night talk show. Yeah.
It was reported that the organizers of King Charles's coronation have officially invited Meghan Markle, and this is nice, at a starting salary of $19 an hour. <laughs> Giving them a hard time, I mean, Asiya. They're just part of pop culture now. They can expect this. We can expect to see it. I don't think they'll see it as a big deal. I mean, I think it's just it's it's just another talk show, and I think it, we're going to see more of it. It's going to happen. But like I said, they're kind of in the psyche of pop culture at the moment. Don't know how I felt about seeing Meghan dressed up as a. I, I was going to ask about that. Serving the royal family, it's giving. But the supposed <laughs> joke was she was invited to the coronation yeah. for but, but nineteen dollars an hour. But on, on, a, on SNL, on Saturday Night Live, there is a running joke that Michael Che, who is that particular presenter, is given jokes that make him look racist. He is a man of colour, as you know. Oh. And you kind of have to know that that is a running gag. In, uh, he's sort of mocking himself in a way or making himself out to be... I mean, it did look like yeah. a bad look. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. I was but, like, mm. yeah. But like I said, the part of pop culture, and I think, you know, they're going to have to expect this now. I mean, it does mean people are still talking about them, which I guess, you know, if you're of that school of thought, well, it's, it's well, good news. Absolutely. I mean, they're still making headlines on these, on these, you know, comedy shows, but that's not the headlines that they hoped to achieve when they went to America, is but it? I that's suppose not the they want. if it's true that her blog, her, you know, um, oh, the yeah. TIG, TIG, if it's, it's TIG, TIG is back. coming back, coming back yeah. then she can address all these issues in the TIG, because, you know, there might be an Agony Aunt column in there or something That'd be nice. similar. Yeah. I might write in. A candle. I think Afia and I are quite excited about it. Yeah. Isn't it back. meant to be modelled on Gwyneth Paltrow's goop? But listen, I mean, if it's modelled on Gwyneth Paltrow's goop, that's fine, but we don't need any candles I that just, smell yeah. of anything mm. at all, ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, that is all we've got time for this week. My thanks to Afia, Matt and Daisy. If you want to join in the debate, make sure you leave a comment. We will be back next week with all of the latest on the Royal Family. And from next week, as well as finding us here on YouTube, you can also find us on Talk TV, 9.30 on Friday nights. We hope you can join us and we'll see you then.